Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing people from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater who strives to optimize every living ecosystem. Passionate about looking after this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that dwell among it. Today's conversation is with the amazing Robert Sheik. Robert is an OG vegan and has been eating plant-based since 1995. He's the best-selling author of books, Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, Shred It, Plant-Based Muscle, and this conversation is backed on his new book, The Plant-Based Athlete. As a two-time natural bodybuilding champion, Robert is considered one of Veg News Magazine's most influential vegan athletes and is the founder and president of Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness. I'm super stoked to be able to share this conversation with you all. I know Rob is a source of inspiration for a lot of people and has a wealth of knowledge, so I really tried to get every drop of wisdom out of him. This conversation is large spanning in terms of topics, but we'll touch on bodybuilding, uh, weight loss, muscle gain, fasting, and a lot of it will be about finding your why and getting those intrinsic motivations to be really dug deep in, into the grain of your soul. But with that being said, I will see you guys on the other side. Mr. Robert Sheik, welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast. How are you going? Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Uh, it's great to be here with you today and looking forward to today's conversation. Look, mate, I've got to start with a congrats on your upcoming book. I believe it's June 15th that it's scheduled to release. How are you feeling? Yeah, the new book is called The Plant-Based Athlete. It's super exciting. I mean, this book is something that, you know, I've told you it's a couple of years in the making, but it's really a lifetime in the making. This is something yeah. that I've been working toward. You know, I've been plant-based for more than 25 years now, but I've also been interested in writing for uh, something like 33 years. I've wanted to be a writer. And so though it's not my first book, it's certainly the biggest book that I've ever written uh, and the best book that I've ever written. And I, I know my co-author, Matt Frazier from No Meat Athlete, and I are just super excited to have it in store shelves in, in less than two months. So I'm really, really excited about that. That's awesome. What was your inspiration for it? Well, what I wanted to do was tell the compelling stories of the world's greatest plant-based athletes. You know, I've been around the space for a long time. I've met a lot of plant-based athletes along the way. And some of them have just such amazing stories that I really wanted to get those stories out there. I wanted uh, the, the general population to know that some of the world's greatest athletes are in fact plant-based. And some of them you've seen in the Game Changers, some of them have written their own books like Scott Jurek or Rich Roll or, mm. or Brennan Brazier or Fiona Oaks. But this is a way to encompass all of that under one umbrella, so to speak. And so, you know, I spent months interviewing people. I interviewed about 60 world-class plant-based athletes, including about a dozen Olympians, another dozen world champions, another, you know, a couple dozen uh, professional and elite uh, plant-based athletes, and then, and tons of others, including some recently retired, like people like Brendan Brazier, who are iconic in the plant-based athlete movement, but no longer compete, but still have some amazing stories to tell. So that was really the impetus behind this book was to, to tell those amazing and compelling stories and to get people inspired to want to perhaps be their own personal best and have a plant-based diet fuel that pursuit. I love that. And I can't wait to get stuck into it. I mean, these are a lot of people, the names you've listed off are an inspirational bunch of humans. And I'm sure lots of people find you as a source of inspiration. I'm wondering, you know, especially 25 years ago when you first began your journey and even now, who are like some people that inspire you? Yeah. So, you know, when I was getting started, it was really, it was my older sister who inspired me to become vegan in the first place. When I was 15 years old and living on a farm and raising farm animals, she inspired me to no longer, uh, you know, con continue consuming uh, our animal friends, and I became vegan. And back then, there were other people who were authors, like like Howard Lyman, uh, who now must be, you know, 75 years old or maybe 80 years old, uh, and John Robbins, uh, who 
Uh, I'm so thrilled that he endorsed my new book. You know, he's just one of the the, the greats of all times. You know, uh, he wrote Diet for New America and was very, very popular here in the US. I think it sold like 3 million copies and inspired a whole yeah. lot of people to become vegan back in the, oh, it must have been 80s or 90s. I think that's the one that was written with Clapper. Is that the one? Uh, I don't know for sure, but but Clapper is a buddy of mine as well. And and, and I love that guy. Uh, and, and also Clapper is another hero. You know, when you talk about people I look up to, either then or now, um, you know, Howard Lyman, John Robbins, my sister, Michael Clapper, Brenda Davis, um, people like that come to mind. And then, you know, I got into sports, obviously I was an athlete for a long time or have been an athlete uh, the, the entire time that I've been plant-based. And, you know, I, I had long distance running role models, uh, you know, people who were, who were not vegan that, but just people I looked up to like Steve Prefontaine here in the U S and ironically, Carl Lewis, who I did, had no idea was plant-based. I had no idea he was vegan, including in the 90s. But I had posters of him on my wall in my bedroom growing awesome. up. You know, and, and, and it's cool because I've communicated with him um, just briefly uh, since then. And that's been really uh, fun for me because he was a childhood hero of mine. And, you know, these days, uh, you know, I'm just motivated and inspired by people who are, who are being their authentic self and following their passion and making it happen and trying to make a difference in the world around them. And that's what really, um, you know, really inspires me today. People who just, you know, take the, that risk, you know, believe in themselves and go do something meaningful to make a difference. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's the community that I like to be part of. I love that. Um, especially, you know, looking up to just everyday people that maybe just are their authentic self. And that is something that a lot of people don't actually achieve. Um, but let's get stuck into bodybuilding because it's something that I, you know, loved as a 15, 16 year old, not so much now, but I'm still fascinated with the sport and something I've been talking to a lot of people about recently is actually fasting and the concept of water fasting. And, you know, obviously Clapper is a huge proponent of this, and that could also come in terms of like intermittent fasting and different things like that. I'm wondering yeah. if in the realms of bodybuilding if something like this is ever talked about because it's such like a scary thing like you go on this fast like, oh i'm gonna lose all my muscle and, and all these things like is that something that you think bodybuilders should look into have you ever looked into it like what's your thought on that yeah it's really it's really funny uh you mentioned that because no more than 15 minutes ago i was texting with a friend who just finished a five-day water fast wow and he's asking nice. me questions about what to introduce back into his diet. Uh, he knows I have a little bit of background in this. I haven't done much fasting myself, but my wife did a 14 day water fast at true North. In fact, nice. um, Dr. Clapper was, you know, was her doctor at the time when he was there, this was years ago. And, uh, and, and I just did a video with Dr. Clapper and rich roll, not that long ago. And I think I'm, I'm sure fasting came up during that conversation, uh, during, uh, Dr. Clapper's, uh, moving medicine forward masterclass. Uh, that I was part of, and very fortunate to be part of, uh, along with uh, you know Rich, who's a great inspiration, and it is becoming something uh, that's talked about more and more. In fact, an, another uh, vegan bodybuilder, Will Tucker, uh, he's in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I used to be his neighbor. We lived you know ten minutes apart. Uh, he's been into a lot of intermittent fasting recently. And who was it? Just oh, just the other day, another. Another vegan bodybuilder was talking to me about it. Uh, I can't even remember. I've done so many conversations and so many yeah. interviews <laughs> and all this with this new book coming out. I'll have to think who was, but obviously um, it, it is something that is, is gaining more and more traction. And, um, and David Goldman, who's the chief science advisor mm -hmm. for the Game Changers, has, has been really into it and been uh, doing some research on that. And I think maybe even writing a paper on that. He was talking about this, you know, years ago when my, my, in fact, when my wife was at True North at the water fasting facility by Dr. Goldhammer, uh, uh, David was there giving presentations and, and talking with people uh, about that, including about maintaining muscle mass during that time uh, of, of fasting. So it is a fascinating thing. It's something that I, I know uh, my friend, John Lewis, you're probably familiar with him as Badass Vegan. Uh, he's a pretty popular guy. Uh, he's toured in Australia as I have, and he's, uh, he, he, you know, he's a friend of mine. So, you know, I, I believe him. He claims that he's been eating one meal a day uh, for the past eight years, uh, just a feeding window for about an hour or so. And he's a big guy. I mean, he's about six foot six, uh, probably 240 pounds, former wow. college basketball player, a uh, big guy. And so, you know, according to 
whatever information is out there uh, from Dr. Goldhammer, uh, David Goldman, others who were in this space, Dr. Clapper, that uh, you can maintain muscle mass as, even as a bodybuilder doing uh, various forms of fasting. Oh, and I actually remembered who it was. This is hilarious. <laughs> it's actually my co-author, uh, yeah. <laughs> Matt Fraser, who's not a bodybuilder, but I was on his podcast, the No Meat Athlete Radio podcast, and that's where it came up. I it was just um, a week ago. So, uh, so it's another. Uh, you know, my co-author I didn't even know was was dabbling into this, but he's doing a um, one day a week fasting. And so, but basically, I was saying he was asking me about the same kind of things, like, does this work in bodybuilding? And to me, it makes sense. Because when you put it on muscle, you know, getting bigger and stronger, it's all about a calorie surplus over a period of time. Um, it, it, that does not mean a 24 hour period, right? It, I mean, we don't do anything in 24 hours. You know, you don't, you don't learn a language, you don't learn a new skill. You don't, you, there's very few things. You don't, you don't gain 10 pounds in one day. There's, you don't lose 20 pounds in one day. You don't reverse disease in one day. Whatever we do is, is accumulated. You know, it's, it's our actions accumulating over time. And so, so yeah, you can, you can fast one day a week, or you can fast, you know, throughout the day, uh, intermittently, you can, you know, fast a couple times a month, whatever the case is, but as long as you're still eating a calorie surplus and, and hopefully doing some sort of resistance weight training. So that surplus goes toward building muscle, not fat, then that makes, that makes sense to me that, um, those things are compatible fasting and, and, and bodybuilding. And in fact, it might even do really good for your digestive system, you know, bodybuilders are, are known for eating a lot of food. I've certainly eaten a lot of food. I've, I've gained a hundred pounds since becoming vegan from 120 pounds to 220 pounds, uh, which is roughly what I am right now. And that's a lot, you know, it's a lot of just eating all the time and giving your, your body, your digestive system, uh, just your body in general, a break from that, I think can help, you know, conserve a lot of energy and, and just, uh, be really good for, for, for yourself in the long run too. So, uh, it's something I've played around with a little bit in the past. Um, the only, I guess, fasting I would say I do these days is that typically my first meal of the day, it's a little bit, you know, later on, like 11 AM noon, that kind of thing. So I, I just, I just wake up and I, I work on the computer and drink water and all this. And I just kind of start my day and then I start eating later on. So I do have that little bit of sleeping plus, the first four hours of waking. So we're talking a 12 hour period. And then I just pretty much eat the rest of the day. <laughs> I love that. I mean, you talked, you touched on something that I find quite fascinating and that's a calorie surplus. And generally speaking, and you know, just from the outside looking in, you think, okay, to gain weight, you eat a calorie surplus. To lose weight, you live with a calorie deficit. And I'm curious on your thoughts because someone can take this, the and I'm sure this isn't your intention and I'm sure you have a different philosophy on it, but someone could take this extremely the wrong way because I could live on a calorie surplus eating Maccas for three times a day, or I could live on a calorie deficit drinking nothing but Diet Coke and eating carrots. So right, right. what? Yeah, what's your thoughts on how or what foods you should be eating when it comes to a calorie surplus or deficit? Is it as simple as just not hitting or hitting extra calories, or is there some other things at play there? Yeah, here's here's how what it is, Tom. Of course, I talk about eating a, a whole food plant based diet as the foundation of diet. That that's that's just key, right? Of course, there's I believe there's room for other things. You can have burritos and wraps and taco shells and curry with a bunch of coconut milk and you know whatever, um, you know oil and your vegan pizza. Like the idea is to be is to eat as health healthfully as possible, but still, you know, have fun and be practical and, and, you know, and be low, low stress about it as well. And so when I'm talking to people, I'm saying, listen, if you want to eat a calorie surplus, let's say you burn, you know, 2,500 calories during the day, you want to eat a little bit of a surplus. I'm just talking like 27, 2,800 calories, you know, about three, two to 300 extra calories per day, because again, that accumulates every single day for a week, for you know two weeks, a month, you're talking thousands of extra calories. And I'm, and I'm talking like eating like an extra sweet potato, you know, an extra half a cup of blueberries, you know, a little bit more broccoli uh, in your, you know, in, on your pasta or whatever it is you're eating, um, a little bit of extra lentil soup, perhaps, uh, or maybe have, uh, you know, two oranges instead of one. Uh, it's, it's so easy to do. Like, 
have three bananas for breakfast instead of one or add some extra berries or walnuts on your oatmeal in the morning. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about going crazy with eating like all this extra vegan ice cream or products with, loaded with oil that's 4,000 calories per pound and super calorie dense and having nut butter on everything. Not at all. I'm talking like take your normal diet, you your normal diet that is hopefully based on healthy foods of uh, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and hopefully lots of leafy greens in there for their overall nutrition and a good variety of fruit and add just a little bit more. That's all it is, you know? And like, I've already trained for two hours today. I'm probably gonna train a little bit more later. I trained two hours yesterday. I am I am just about 220 pounds, um, slightly lighter, maybe 215 or so, because uh, I've been doing a little bit extra cardio the last few, I mean, just a few days. And so, you, you know, I'm, I'm just eating a little bit extra, you know, like I, I, I look around at what do I have at home? Maybe I just have like, I, I was heating up some, I had, I just, just right before this, I had some rice and green beans and broccoli and carrots. And I think there was, I don't know what it was, a zucchini or uh, something in there as well with some curry sauce. And while that was being prepared and, and heating up, I just had a little bit of a snack before that because I just I just come back from a workout and so I ate just a little bit uh, of of some uh, potato and, and leek soup you know in addition to that so that that's how I'm talking about eating in a surplus mm. and and I've learned from that because when I was younger in my 20s and really into bodybuilding and hardcore into it I was eating seven Cliff bars a day five protein drinks a day. And I would literally be, Tom, I'm telling you, I would be lying in bed, chewing on a cliff bar just to reach my 5,000 calorie intake goal, you know, it's because I was hardcore bodybuilder guy. And it, that wasn't, that didn't really do me any good. I mean, yeah, I, I, I added a lot of weight pretty fast, but you know, my stomach didn't feel all that great. Uh, a lot of bloating, a lot of gas, a lot of discomfort, yeah. a lot of tr trouble trying to fall asleep. Um, a lot of those foods, you know, may have caffeine in them as well, especially some of these shakes or stimulants or, or, you know, chocolate covered this or tea infused this, I am simply saying, you know, go have, uh, some more raspberries, go have some more strawberries, uh, have, have, uh, an extra side salad, um, uh, you know, during the day, I, I, I add some chickpeas to a meal that you wouldn't normally put them in that kind of thing. That's to me, how you eat in a healthy surplus. And I'm so obsessed with the fact that things accumulate. That is just how it works. I mean, yeah. that's how I gained a hundred pounds. It, it was, it was work, doing work today. That's going to impact me a year from now. It's building consistent habits. And that's how I wrote a book, you know, writing a book is hard. It's a hundred thousand words, 350 pages. It takes a lot of work, but not if you do it every single day it adds up. Uh, and that's the same with adding mass, you know, got to be patient and just do it day after day. And, and eventually there it comes as long as you're consistent and stay true to yourself. I love that. And I think that's the case with a lot of things, you know, you saving money only benefits future you working out like, yeah, you get the endorphins and all of that, but that ultimately benefits future you. So you can live longer and live with more vitality. And a lot of the time it comes down to this term called delayed gratification, to which you have to have a certain source of motivation, something that's more intrinsic. Um, it's really hard to have delayed gratification looking at external things. Like if you just want to pick up girls and you go into the gym, you're not going to last that long, I think, in my opinion, unless you find something inside that really keeps the fire burning. So you know, you've been bodybuilding for 25 years. Like what's your motivation to even keep going? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. And really uh, my answer might sound silly, but it's connecting the dots. I've just, I've always been a fan of connecting the dots before they happen. What I mean by that is I was a skinny kid. You know, I was, when I was four, uh, 13, 14 years old, I weighed 89 pounds. I, uh, when I was 15 years old, almost 16 at the time, actually. So late into being 15, I weighed 120 pounds when I became vegan. I had no business in the sport of bodybuilding. I mean, really, it was laughable. I mean, you could you could just point your finger and laugh at me in the gym, skinny little guy trying to lift weights. But I, I could picture it like right then. I, I could connect the dots and say, you know what? You know, not seven years from now, you know, not five years from now, this is going to help me later on. Like, I, I just knew that. And I became vegan because I wanted to make a difference for animals. And I knew that, you know what? I, I am a small guy. I know that. I always have been. I'm a long distance runner. I'm a soccer player. Uh, I'm a you know, lightweight wrestler, I'm track and field athlete. I'm, I'm just a small guy. 
But if I can get bigger and stronger, and this is like back in the 1990s, and show people that I can do it without eating eating animal protein, that's going to make a difference. At least that's what I thought. And so that was part of me connecting the dots too, that if I can do this, if I can show people that you can build muscle without eating animal protein on a vegan diet, that maybe that would save animal lives by inspiring others that they could do the same. And so what happened? Sure enough, it did. And it gave me a story to tell. And I, I built a website, veganbodybuilding.com. And then in 2005, I filmed a documentary called Vegan Fitness Built Naturally and you know went around the country selling DVDs, You know, sold a few thousand DVDs. This is back before YouTube, by the way. <laughs> this is old school. And like, I knew that would make that could make a difference. We built community. And then now I had this story I'd gained at this point in my you know early 20s. I'd gained 75 pounds as a vegan because uh, a lot of weight comes on quickly, right? Uh, you know, I've only gained 15 or, or no, 25 pounds since, but that's first 75 pounds uh, came in the first seven years. And here I was a former skinny non-vegan farm kid and, and now a champion vegan bodybuilder that was connecting the dots to my other passion in life as a kid, which was writing books. I wanted to write books. I, and, and now that gave me something to write about. And sure enough, I wrote my first book, which then gave me an opportunity for my second book, which then led to the third book, which then inspired the fourth book which then brought me here to this point with my fifth book. And so I just, I just look into the future and what do I need to do right now? Here's an example, Tom. You're the first person I reached out to in Australia for a podcast, right? I'm working on trying to get a book deal in Australia. That's very likely going to happen. Uh, Australia, New Zealand. And reaching out to you put me in touch with three other uh, podcasters in Australia. Some I've already recorded just based on their schedule, just slightly ahead of you. But... <laughs> You know, this is that that was all part of it, right? And so now I can go back to my my agent and be like, "Hey, I've just appeared on on a four podcast uh, in Australia. Also, one of the athletes in our book is uh, uh, James Newberry, uh, Australia's fittest man. What four times or something? He's uh, one of the athletes featured in our book. He's got a recipe in the book and all this. Uh, you know, I have this I have this now momentum to go achieve this other thing, which is getting my book." In, uh, in in foreign countries outside the U.S. and Canada, and, and, and these things, like, I just think about this kind of stuff. stuff. And so that is, uh, you know, that's what keeps me motivated. I just look into the future, right? I, I just I, I see what what do I want to do next, and, and how will this best uh, impact the environment, animals, and and help me in in my own pursuit of happiness. And, and so, what's fulfilling for me with, that's also purposeful. And so that's what keeps me motivated. You know, I've got a sore back, I've been lifting weights for 20, 25 years. I've got, you know, I just lifted for, like I said, for two hours, just right before here, I actually trained back. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to be lifting forever. I'm, I'm 41 years old now. That's, uh, I still feel pretty young, but my back feels a lot older than that, to be honest. It's a lot of weightlifting uh, for a guy who maybe should have stuck to long distance running. That is something I was good at, but you know, I, I just, I keep on keeping on because for those same reasons that I became vegan 25 years ago, that I want to show people that you don't have to sacrifice your fitness results because of a compassionate lifestyle and diet. And so that's, that's what keeps me going. Do you have any advice for someone else who wants to find that reason that will keep them going on? Yeah, it's, it's, it's common or cliche to say, you know, to find your why and, and all that. But I think actually just asking yourself why over and over. So why veganism? You know, so I answer that question for myself. You know, why bodybuilding? You know, I, I have my own reasons. It was meaningful to me. It was something I hadn't, you know, I, I was always the small guy, right? I wanted something different. I wanted to feel empowered. I wanted to lead by example. I wanted to be bigger and stronger. I wanted to be more confident. You know, I have my own reasons, just like my own reasons for being vegan, my own reasons to be a writer, my own reasons to hop on this podcast today. And so you just have to ask yourself why over and over, because that will bring you back to your purpose. That'll bring you back to your passion, or at least your, your feeling of joy or gratitude for doing what you're doing. I realize that not everybody has passion for something. It's, it's, a, it's a special gift that some people have and some people don't. There's, there's just, that's just the way it is. There's some people deal with mental health issues, deal with depression, deal with um, a troubled life, deal with poverty, deal with oppression, deal with all kinds of things. And it's very, and it, you can't just say, uh, you can't just blanket say, Hey, smile more and feel better. Like when people have real struggles and, you know, I've been there myself a little bit, uh, with, with depression and, and, and sports injuries and, and 
that led to uh, adding a bunch of body weight and, and having uh, body image issues and, and feeling like a failure more times than I could ever count in so many business ventures and so many <laughs> projects from failed books to failed film projects to failed speaking gigs to failed uh, fitness results to, you know, all kinds of you know, failed friendships, all, all kinds of stuff. I've, I've certainly felt some of that. And so it's, it's hard to just say, oh, you, know, you just haven't found your passion yet, Tom. You know, you just got to be happy like me, you know, and post, you know, thumbs up photos on Instagram. Uh, so, but, but, but I do believe that we can find some joy in the process because anything outside of the darkness or the struggle that's better than that is a moment of joy or, or of happiness or, or something more positive or more pleasant. And, and so I, I encourage people to seek that out. So, you know, you know, it, it doesn't mean that, that weightlifting is the type of exercise for you. It doesn't mean that running is the type of exercise for you or swimming or hiking or anything like that. But I bet there's something that you enjoy. You know, I'm not talking to you, <laughs> Tom, but to your listeners, there's got to be something you enjoy out there. And you just have to try enough things to figure it out. Like, I, you know, like I said, I, why bodybuilding? That's, that's so far from my skill set. I was, I was a pretty good runner. I, I really, really, I was, I was quite fast. I took a lot of pride in that. And, and and ran long distance uh, races in high school and in college and and after that and and just had such a great time with it but i tried bodybuilding you know i tried weightlifting and i found that i enjoyed it and I, you know it's something i maybe i never would have discovered had uh, a childhood friend not introduced me to it and so that changed the course of my life forever i mean i wouldn't be talking to you i wouldn't be on the verge of very very hopefully uh, releasing a new york times best selling book if I didn't try something new. And so uh, I, I encourage people, whether it's, uh, whether it's foods and trying to uh, experiment with a creative plant-based diet and try new foods, like, you know, in, in your region, perhaps, or uh, certainly when I was in Southeast Asia, I mean, some of the best tasting foods ever, like mangosteen and this, this incredible fruit that just, you, you don't necessarily get it out here in the U.S., but I mean, I mean, ex ex experimenting with different types of foods, different types of exercise and different hobbies. You know, this is a true story. You, you want to know this? This is kind of funny. Just yesterday, I was texting with Brendan Brazier, really one of the, the, the great vegan athletes of all time. And I was asking him, you know, what are your hobbies? Because I found myself being so stressed out for a long time now. This book has taken two to three years to write just this one specific project. And now all this marketing, you know, not that I don't enjoy talking to you today, Tom, but you know, I'm, I'm doing this <laughs> Be all honest, the time. Robert. I'm doing this all the time. I'm doing uh, podcasts and live videos and interviews, yeah. and, and I've got many more to come 50 to a hundred more to come, you know, in the, in the coming months. But, and that's what it takes to, to have a best-selling book. You like, you just, it's connecting the dots ahead of time. I'm, I'm not going to make it there if I don't do this kind of stuff. It all adds up. But I was asking my, my long time, uh, friend and a great mentor of mine, Brendan Brazier, what do you do, man? Because he's already written five books. He's toured all over the world. He's done all this stuff. And and so, you know, he he gave me uh, some advice, you know, where uh, he he's working on a project right now, um, just basically out in the woods. You know, he's he talked about less screen time, uh, more purposeful time, um, that it's okay to do something like watching television, which I've been opposed to for pretty much 20 years because I was so focused on productivity, 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 make every moment count, 1,440 minutes every day. What are you doing with your time? And I said, man, I'm just burning out. I just got to, you know, and I used to travel a lot and I can't do that now with COVID. And so like, what do you do? And so, you know, these are conversations that I actually have uh, because I'm trying to find my own joy in the process with, uh, you know, people see the the great aspects of, oh, you're, you know, you're in good shape, or you post these flexing photos, you look pretty good. Or you have this book out here that is endorsed by all these wonderful people. And, and there's a lot of excitement around it, but behind the scenes, it's, it's a, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough road with, uh, with a lot of expectation and a lot of deadlines and a lot of stress and a lot of worry and anxiety. And so for anybody on whatever path you're on, look for those moments of joy, you know, because that's what's going to keep you going when things do get tough. Yeah, I love that. Um, geez, I'm so glad I let you go on for such a long time because I feel like there's so many beautiful nuggets in there. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, will find that really valuable. But I want to switch gears now to 
your expertise in another realm, which is bodybuilding. And obviously you've given us a nice dose of motivation, but I'm curious, you know, I've seen the photos of you online and clearly looking at you now. When you're holding up any item, it looks small next to your biceps. Like it's insane. It's like some sort of those those mirrors that make everything look small. So I'm curious when you're when you're at the gym and you're you know you're wearing a big and strong shirt or you're you know you're having these conversations. Surely, surely you don't get asked where do you get your protein from. Yeah, a, a lot less these days, to be honest. Um, and and yeah, I do wear those messages like uh, plants have all the protein you need in the back of my hoodie. I uh, wear vegan messages on my, I, ha- I wear, I wear a long pants, a, a hoodie, a hat, you know, but I still lift some pretty heavy weight. So even though I'm kind of covered head to toe, mostly to stay warm, to be honest. And secondly, just with, you know, COVID stuff going on and everything, I just kind of cover up and, and do my thing. Uh, people, people do take notice, you know, I mean, uh, I noticed that the other day, you know, pressing, uh, 110 pound dumbbells for chest press, you know, so 110 pounds in each hand. And I noticed some people, cause my wife was taking a little video for fun that people in the, in the background kind of looking like, you know, looking over and like, you know, they're like, I mean, they can't lift that much. And, and they see the messaging that I'm wearing. And also funny, you asked just three days ago, it must've been a, or four days ago, a Sunday or something. There, I was, I was leaving the gym and the guy behind the counter, one of the guys, uh, said something to me, got my attention said, Hey, uh, I just wanted to let you know, um, you know, you inspired me to go vegan. And I've talked to this guy once ever, just, he saw my vegan hoodie and he's like, are you, so you're really vegan? Cause I'm, you know, quite a bit larger than him. And I said, yeah. And, and he's, Oh, I can never do that. And it was actually a little bit annoying. I, okay. You know, well, you know, I, I don't know what I said exactly, but I, you know, I didn't completely blow them off or brush them off. I said, well, you know, you don't know until you try. And I suggested just give it a try. I mean, and left it at that. That was months ago. But uh, just a few days ago, he he caught my attention as I was leaving because he said, hey, I want to let you know, um, tomorrow's my last day here at work. Uh, I'll be leaving this job and doing something different. Um, but I wanted to let you know that you inspired me to to go vegan. I you know, didn't know that I could. And that kind of stuff happens. Uh, and I don't have to talk a lot. I know I talk a lot, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of long winded in some of my storytelling and some of my answers, uh, when I, when I'm in interviews like this or conversations like this, but yeah, you know, I don't do a lot of talking these days. I, I wear messages and I just try to let my actions speak for themselves. And regarding some of those, like the photos and such, a lot of it is just like the right angle, you know, <laughs> like, like, like I, I noticed that too, where I, I, I flex with a book and I'm like, oh man. I, I think I out angled the book there. Um, but uh, so some of that is just the, the, I think the angle of the camera, my tripod or where I stand. But I, in, in general, you know, I do feel like at age 41, I'm in some of the best shape I've ever been in. I've still got some body fat to lose because I've been deliberately <laughs> trying really hard to get over 220 pounds because that, that, that solidifies a 100 pound uh, weight gain as a vegan, which allows me to write articles about it, including with mainstream media. It allows people to kind of scratch their head. Wait a minute. You can, I hear about veganism for weight loss, but you can gain weight. You can build muscle. You can get bigger. It was just part of my goal as well. So, uh, so I know I've got some body fat to lose. Hence these, uh, these two hour workouts recently with a little bit extra cardio, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's, I, I guess, uh, how I carry myself at the gym these days is really just with message gear and not just my own brand or anything. I mean, we're all kinds of people's brands, not just vegan bodybuilding or vegan strong. I wear whatever people send me, you know, I had a, I had a shirt I wore yesterday powered by tofu that PETA sent me. So I wore that and had something else uh, from PETA the other day and some, from some other brand. Uh, I don't, I don't even remember what I wore exactly um, today. Uh, I wore forks over knives hoodie a couple of days ago, just, Oh, I had a Beyond Meat hat on today. Uh, you know, a popular brand, especially out here in the yeah. US. So, so yeah, I just wear this stuff, and I, I spend two hours in the gym, or I, you know, I post photos online, and I, I, I try to uh, let actions and results speak for themselves. I love that, and I'm sure a lot of these conversations wouldn't really be a thing 25 years ago. Like, it would be so difficult to make someone take that leap to you know, become vegan, especially when it comes to like an ethical sense, because information is so widely or easily accessible nowadays. I'm wondering what it's been like for you over 25 years watching 
the vegan and plant-based movement evolve? Yeah, that, you know, Tom, the first thing that comes to mind, and I'll tell you, this is what it was really like in 1995. And I, I grew up in a farming community as well. The number one issue was that people were concerned for my health. People were, my, my parents, my probably siblings, my coaches, my teachers, they were worried that if I stopped consuming animals, I wasn't going to get proper nutrition, not just protein, but just proper nutrition in general. Now you fast forward 25 years later, what's the common association with a plant-based diet? Very often, at least in what I see, is that people say, oh, I know I should go vegan for my health. I know I should go be become plant-based for my health. It's the complete opposite conversation. It was, people were worried, like legitimately worried about me when I became vegan. And I was, a, like I said, I was a small guy too. And I, I, you know, I was a teenager. The internet wasn't really a thing. Uh, I didn't have a lot of my own money. That, so how am I going to go out and buy my own food and, and, and make sure I, I do this right. You know, make sure I, I, I do my research and, you know, it's all, it's all silly. You know, people saying, you yeah, make sure you do your research on this diet when they're eating hot dogs and cheeseburgers and pizza and alcohol and soda. I mean, come on, give me a break. But that's what it was like. And, and so for 25 years now, I've, I've, I've dealt with that question, where do you get your protein? What about this? What about that? You know, you, you, you label yourself as something and that comes to the territory. You know, you're going to get those kind of questions. You're going to mm. get those conversations and you just, that's what you sign up for. Uh, at least that's what I signed up for. And so I have those conversations. And like I said, even this guy at the gym here the other day, you know, I really didn't, I, you know, I just kind of answered a few brief questions for him when he was like, yeah, I could never do that. And at first I thought he was saying it in kind of like a mocking way. I'm like, oh man, you know, not this again, but I just gave him a few ideas. And sure enough, months later, he's like, man, you inspired me to do this. And, and he, you know, just wanted to tell me that before, you know, he left his job because I probably wouldn't see him again. And, you know, or he wouldn't see me again. So, so conversations have changed over the years, uh, but there was definitely a lot of, a lot more resistance 20, 25 years ago. And, I, and of course I was into it for animal rights. Like I still am today, but I was certainly wasn't like a health guy. I wasn't writing books or articles or giving presentations or on tour or doing interviews. I was just talking about animal rights, about other animals have the same desires that we do to live a life free of fear, pain, and suffering. And we should give them that opportunity. And that, you know, th that suffering is significant on a large scale, and especially in factory farming, especially in animal testing, especially in these large scale operations that are just absolutely miserable for animals, including ones that are, that are only born to be consumed in factory farm animals for food. They're, they're, they're just born. They're brought into the world to, to be, you know, essentially a, 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 a captivity and then, you know, and, and then slaughtered and turned into somebody's food. I mean, it's, there's no, there's no joy in that life. And that I, I spoke a lot about that uh, in, in high school and, and many years since then about the things that we can do to, alleviate that suffering by just simply living a compassionate lifestyle. And the fact that you don't have to sacrifice these, you know, these fitness results or job or, or education or other things in life, you can just go about your regular life and be a, be a professional at something in, in business or work or athletics or science or math or anything and, and live a compassionate lifestyle, you know, the, the whole time. So, so the, the conversations have changed, but my why and my reasons are still are still the same for doing what I do. Awesome. And I love how how now I think veganism has come to play with everyone's values. Like let's be honest, there's a there's a pretty small percentage of the population that actually wants to be healthy, and those are the people who are generally going to be leading towards a whole food plant-based diet. But there's an opportunity for those who are into or get into the the ethics, the morality and the environmental factors that can still eat the hot dogs and the burgers and the pizzas and all this crap because there's so many options. So I'm really glad that that is now a thing. So I'm curious, Rob, how does muscle growth even work? How do you even grow muscles? Like, is that just like going to the gym, few bicep yeah. curls, few pull downs, few chest presses? What's the go? Yeah. So what you have to do is create micro tears in muscle fibers that damages muscle fibers that then need to be repaired through the calories that we consume, the amino acids, particularly the building blocks of protein that we consume uh, to then repair and grow and get stronger and get bigger over time. And so, you know, we naturally just grow as we, as we age, of course, through adolescence and all that, but then we kind of reach our 
wh- you know, whatever size we're going to be at in our 20s, usually uh, for most people. And then you want to get bigger. You've got to put stress on your on your muscles, but not stress like long distance running stress. Uh, you're not necessarily going to put on muscle that way. You might get leaner. You might get uh, uh, trim and 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 ripped or shredded or whatever, but not a lot of muscle mass. So to me, what it means is creating micro tears through resistance training. That is typically with th- free weight exercises, barbells, dumbbells, machines, cables, but it can also be body weight. I mean, pull-ups are very, very difficult. Many Most people can't do them. Uh, and push-ups are difficult, again, for most people. Uh, squats and lunges, even with your own body weight, most people can't do all that many uh, if, they, if they really give it a go. And so it's, it's that kind of, it's typically compound multi-joint movements. So think squat, think bench press, think deadlift, but also think rows and presses, you know, shoulder presses, overhead presses, chest presses, uh, those kinds of things. You can do things like bicep curls and tricep extensions, and, you, you know, you can do some stuff there, but it's not necessarily always, you know, multi-joint kind of thing. Uh, so usually it's those bigger compound lifts that are going to give you the best return on investment. So that's like, that's Olympic lifts, that's powerlifting movements. And it's kind of just the, 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 the main lifts that you get the, the most return on investment. For example, I, I trained legs yesterday and I don't do squats because of some herniated discs in my back. I just, I can't bend that way. And, that's not, me, and that's not me making an excuse. That's, that's 20 years of, of, you know, my, of, of herniated discs, I actually herniated my disc in my back when I was a teenager. So it's, it's been a long time and, and, you know, chiropractic care and massage therapy and all these things to try to help with that. So I don't do squats, but I spent the vast majority of my leg workout doing leg press where I'm, you know, locked in on a hip sled leg press where my back's not bending anything like that, but I can still press heavy weight. And I wear, I wear like these tight pants, you know, these tight workout pants. And even though the mirror is way over there, I could see, you know, my hamstring muscles, like, you know, you know, poking out through my pants and and that, you know, because I'm spending an hour on the leg press rather than doing like the leg extensions or leg curls or something that's provides a a lesser return on investment. So same with, you know, same with chest, you know, you can do flies and you can do some of these lighter things, or you can do some really heavy bench press and incline press and decline press. And maybe that's all you need to do. Maybe that's all you need to do for chest is just those three or three or four exercises. And you don't need to do all the little, you know, ancillary accessory type of, of movements. And same with like, you don't need to go in the gym and do just bicep curls because you can do other movements like bent over rows, T-bar rows, like I did today, with multiple different grips for T-bar rows where I'm training my back, but in the process, I'm training biceps, right? Because that's the, the movement. I was doing pull downs, you know, with uh uh, reverse grip. So it's like, you know, it's, it's training biceps as well on that reverse grip, but it's about, I was doing a back workout, right? So it's, it's finding the movements that, that are comfortable for you. Like I just, I personally don't do deadlifts, don't do squats. My, my lower back won't take it, but I don't have to just sit there on the sidelines and make excuses and cry. I can do leg presses, you know, I can do, um, bent over rows when I'm on the T-bar machine where I rest my chest. Because if I don't, my back will give out and I'll fall on my face uh, and I'll hurt my spine. But I can rest my chest on the pad and, and, and row with my back and get a, a great workout in. So I think it's it's understanding the best exercises for building muscle and, and doing those things that you often don't want to do, like pull-ups, like lunges, like leg press, the things that are kind of hard that we, you know, we'd rather push off for another day. So do more things that are difficult, I think. I love that. I mean, when looking at the whole concept of working out, I heard this thing when I was like, I think maybe 18 or 19. I want to see what your opinion on that is. But when you go and you have a leg workout on, say, Monday, every Monday is my leg day and I'm going to do squats, lunges, yada, yada, insert exercises. And every Monday, I'm going to do the same amount of reps, sets, but maybe I'll increase the weight. Eventually, do you get diminishing returns because you're not switching up your exercises? It's a great question. And I actually don't, I don't know the, the science on that. There might be um, some studies done on that. But just from a aesthetic point of view, just looking at that, I like the idea of, of changing things up after a while. I also like the idea, though, 
of doing the same exercises for weeks at a time, because then you can gauge progression. Are you getting stronger? Or is it becoming easier? And, and some of them are very easy to tell. I mean, you can do six pull-ups one week and you can do seven the next and then eight the next and nine. And that's, you can easily document that progression. Or if you're doing six pull-ups every week, clearly it's not working. Whatever, you know, you're, whatever For whatever reason, you're, you're not progressing. You're just not getting stronger. And so typically uh, maxing out on uh, a certain number of reps, it doesn't need, it doesn't necessarily mean like one rep max, like, you know, how much can you deadlift for one rep? It just means like when you're doing your regular workout, your leg press, your bench press, are you doing eight reps and then, you know, 10 a couple of weeks later, are you still stuck at the same? So I think doing the same workouts for weeks at a time uh, is, you know, can be a great way to gauge, especially if you're kind of new to weightlifting, but then it makes things up like crazy. And I'll tell you, partly, I think I've just been doing this for so long. I don't go in with an agenda anymore, or even a schedule. Like I sometimes walk into the gym and don't even know what muscle group I'm going to train. I just wait till it hits me, you know, as I, as I walk in, I mean, sometimes they're even completely dramatic, uh, like it's totally different, either chest or legs. I mean, these are, these muscle groups are nothing alike. And that actually happened last week. I even posted, I think I texted my, my, my training partner, my friend, Vanessa Espinoza, who I, I wrote a book with a few years ago. I said, like, I'm probably going to train chest or legs today. I didn't even know as I was walking into the gym. And then I kind of, maybe I'll assess like what equipment is being used, who's there. I tend to go during off hours when there's not as many people there and, and see what's available. So now I mix things up like crazy. So today I trained back, like I told you, for um, a little less than two hours because I did some cardio that made that filled the other rest of the time. But I also threw in some ab uh, training as well, just because I hadn't trained my abdominals in a little while and thought, you know, this is a pretty long back workout. Let's make something else in there. And, and even my back workout, I was like, I moved around. I was going to do these certain um, uh, T-bar rows, but then, you know, somebody was over there. So I went to go do the lat pull downs with, with the only, the only intention is buying my time so that I could go back over there. And I, I ended up doing three different grips, you know, like a wide grip, uh, a, a, a narrow grip, then a super narrow grip. And that was great. I got like 15 sets out of it that I, I wasn't planning on. And that was just on the fly. I thought of it. So I, I think there's something, there's some value in, in the, creativity and the variety um, that, that aids in the progression and also just in the, in the fun and the fulfillment and the excitement, because if you do too much of the same thing, you maybe get bored and, and want to do something different. hundred percent. I'm going to, I want to ask you about mobility. It's something that I was a bit scared of when I first started lifting weights, because a lot of the time you see people that work out quite a bit, lose a bit of range of motion because of their lack of stretching and mobility work. Do you fall into that category? Have you got sucked into that hole? Yeah. You want to see me try to do a stretch behind my head? Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, I'm, you know, to some degree, yes. To some degree I have, I've gotten lazy. You know, I think we all get lazy in some areas. Maybe it's our diet, our nutrition, our training, our sleep, our, you know, uh, hobbies and happiness. Like we just get lazy in some areas. And that's quite frankly, something that I get a little bit lazy in is the, is the stretching. Even though I write about it, I give, you know, my own recommendations about it um, because intellectually I'm totally on board with the stretching and mo mobility and all of that. And sometimes I actually do put it into practice and, and reap the benefits of that, especially with when training legs, because you can reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and you can, uh, you know, just prevent that that many days perhaps of, of significant soreness that then makes you not want to go train other muscle groups because you don't have to sit down on benches and, and then you're kind of lazy around the house because you're sore and all of that. So, uh, you know, I, I've always had some, some mobility issues where, so I think something like yoga or general stretching uh, could benefit me even more than most people. I've just, I mean, I'm, I'm talking even when I was a kid, I couldn't even sit down in elementary school with my legs crossed, like my, you know, my knees like stick, <laughs> stick up in the air. They don't, they don't settle. I can't cross my legs and have my, my knees settle. My, my hips are too tight. And it's been, you know, an, an issue in certain sports with some tight muscles and, and uh, not being able to touch my toes and things like that, you know, for a long time. Uh, I, I'm better at sometimes than others. And, you know, maybe, maybe part of that is putting on a, a decent amount of muscle mass and a, short amount of time, you know, I just can't stretch as well or and not quite as, as mobile as I used to be. But, uh, but it, it's something that I think if we want to prioritize it, we will. And I have at times, 
especially in um, using a sauna or steam room after a workout and uh, and really just allowing that heat, that warmth to help you know bring blood to different muscles in the body and allow them to lengthen and relax. And, and as maybe you probably don't know, but I was trained actually as a uh, sports massage therapist. I became a massage therapist 20 years ago. I did a graduate program in sports massage therapy. I got a chance to work with some, you know, interesting athletes, uh, including briefly the, the United States Olympic uh, ski team, I think, I think it was ski team. Cause I was living out in Utah where there's snow and all that, but uh, you know, that's part of my background is, is sports massage therapy. And, and that's what I used to do for a living. And so I'm, I'm that's how I said, I'm, I'm intellectually on board, but I'm just sometimes I'm lazy, partly with the addiction to uh, certain aspects of, of social media and the internet these days, uh, which I admit, and I'm, I'm fighting against all the time. And, and, and I, you know, I just don't always hold that quiet space for something like mobility, stretching, or even meditation or yoga. I'm a little bit, as you can probably tell, a little bit on the uh, uh, enthusiastic side, high energy side um, that, that that serves me well in a lot, a lot of ways, including public speaking and writing books and being an athlete. But it, it doesn't help me with like <laughs> being able to fall asleep easy at night or or uh, finding the time to meditate or to stretch or to be you know calm and in my own head and and to slow down a little bit. I have a hard time slowing down. So that you know that's my answer for mobility. It's like it's 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 something that is within grasp that I don't always practice for myself. I love that. I mean, it, I think it's a struggle for everyone. I think regardless of working out, it's something quite easy. I mean, personally, I tend to stretch about 20 minutes every morning just for my legs because I've got bad knees as most people do. Um, but to be honest, I'm in the camp, but I wonder if you've felt this way sometimes when I do the odd workout that's resistance training or even sometimes a hit training i purposefully don't stretch because i really want to feel the pain tomorrow <laughs> yeah, do you yeah. ever get that or is that just sadistic me yeah no no no. I, I actually did that yesterday i i was doing the adductor and abductor machines you know yeah. I, you, you bring your legs together Ooh, I, I've, I've, I've done those like a few dozen times my entire life you know in 20 something years of lifting i just don't do those very much because again i'm I'm looking at like, what's the big ROI? And that's doing heavy leg presses of hundreds of pounds, getting your glutes and hamstrings and quads and everything engaged and squeezing your core and breathing hard. And like, you know, but, but when I do those, I get really sore in my glutes, you know, my, my sides, like I I feel it right now, I'm touching it right now. I'm sore. And I, and I wanted to feel that. And so I spent like 20 minutes on those machines. Like I just sat there for a long time. I didn't even count sets or reps. I just kept, I just kept squeezing, <laughs> squeezing legs because I wanted that feeling. Um, and actually it's, it's going to sound really silly. I, maybe I'm the only person who's ever, I don't know, ever done this, but because, because I worked as a, as a massage therapist and went to massage therapy school, therefore I was receiving massage every day for a year. Like I know what it feels like when you do have sore glutes or back or traps to get massage, it's just like this incredible feeling. It's just like, I love that soreness. You know, when some people are like, Oh, maybe don't, Oh, my traps are sore. I don't want to, don't want to massage. Like, no, no, I want like an elbow in my back um, after that. So sometimes if I do have like a, like a massage planned or scheduled, I I will go train uh, and deliberately try to make myself sore because it actually just enhances the this, this the physical feeling of of the of the massage on those muscles because it feels like the most incredible therapeutic training when those muscles are so sore. I mean, I'm talking like calves are a great one. Forearms are unbelievable. Like I, I mean, I could almost give myself goosebumps just imagining what that feels like, you know, um, and actually they're sore right now, but that, you know, I, I, uh, I'm with you. I, sometimes I will purposefully make myself sore, but I also am quick to say that, you know, that's not the, the only determining factor on whether a workout was good or not is if you're sore, because you could easily, uh, warm up properly, stretch throughout, stretch at the end, use heat, ice, uh, you know, uh, hydration, all this. And, and, and even after a, a massive heavy workout does not have soreness. And I've obviously I've done that for years too, but sometimes, yeah, I'll, I'll go out of my way to, uh, to make it hurt. You heard it here. You heard it here first people. We are sadistic. Definitely. 
<laughs> at times. <laughs> uh, at times. Now, I want to go the other side. We talked a lot about putting on weight. I want to know how what your philosophies are on fat loss and losing weight. Yeah, the, Tom, the biggest thing is diet first and foremost. You know, you got to, like my friend Chef AJ says regarding junk food, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. You know, you got to keep uh, junk food away as often as you can. Uh, you still have room for foods that you enjoy and, and fun foods and all that, but just don't eat, just don't eat uh, vegan pizza every single day that's covered in oily vegan cheese and sauces and things like that. And, and maybe don't have vegan ice cream every single night. Uh, maybe don't load up on a ton of calories right before bed. Um, you know, avoid some of the uh, super oil heavy dressings or super heavy processed foods or those loaded in sugars like most sports drinks um, that you're just not going to burn off and it's just going to get stored. And so diet first and foremost, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect. You know, I, I don't eat any animal products, but I do eat some processed foods. You know, like I've told you that will have oils in them that will have flowers in them that will have, I mean, not, you know, not, not, not like pretty flowers, like tulips or daffodils, but you know, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. uh, baked goods or whatever, you know, I'll have pizza, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, the, the idea from my perspective and this is what I write about is that the majority of your calories should come from plant-based whole foods. And, and it's as easy as having a breakfast that is, whether it's oatmeal, maybe it's fruit, maybe it's a green smoothie, maybe it's uh, a cereal with a, a soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, something like that. Uh, it's, it's having things like potatoes and yams and sweet potatoes for lunch or like a burrito bowl with rice and, and vegetables and uh, avocado and, beans and all that. It's having the lentil soup. It's, you know, it's having uh, international cuisine, which is amazing, whether it's uh, you're talking like a, a vegan sushi, you know, Japanese food or, uh, or samosas, you know, vegan Indian food and, or, or, uh, you know, Thai food, which is pr probably my favorite, you know, fried rice or pad Thai or noodle dishes and, um, and fresh rolls with peanut sauce and all that. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, having, you know, real food as the, as the foundation, having as many berries as possible, as many leafy greens as possible. And then how you consume them is up to you. I like to eat berries just like by the handful, you know, and, and have lots of different fruits available, but some people that they like it better on cereal or on oatmeal or in a blender. And, and that's okay. You know, and, and leafy greens, like I'm not, I'm, I'll be honest with you, Tom, I'm not a big salad person. Like I, I think it comes from my, my competitive bodybuilding days of like, you know, I want to get the most, uh, I guess, calorie bang for my buck. I want, I want, I want to eat heavier foods, even though salads are full of nutrition and all this, I just want something heavier, you know, cause I'm trying to get build muscle. So maybe salads, you know, they don't work for me all that often just in a salad, but I load up a sandwich, like maybe a tofu sandwich or burger, whatever, with tons, tons of greens. Um, sometimes I'll even use like a salad mix, you know, that even has like the carrots yeah. and the radish and, and, and cabbage. And I'll put that like in a sandwich. It sounds kind of strange, but it's a way to get those, those, uh, vegetables and, and especially leafy greens, like, like romaine lettuce in there. Um, or, or I'll, I'll add it to uh, some other meal, uh, you know, cause I'm not a big smoothie person either, but there's ways to incorporate those foods. And so, you know, obviously diet's the biggest thing, but also you need to be aware of calorie intake um, versus expenditure. You know, what are you, what are you burning? You know, most people and probably upwards of 99.9%, a pretty high percent of people have no idea how many calories they expend every day or how many calories they consume every day. Really the only people who do are those often in the health or fitness field who maybe use like my fitness pal or chronometer or some way to, to document it. Even experts, doctors, physicians, best-selling authors, people in the plant-based world, they don't have a clue unless they've taken the time to document it. So, so why do we have things like obesity problems, especially here in North America? And I'm sure where you are too. Well, it's because we, we consume an excess of calories every day without knowing it. We, we, have, we have no idea how many calories are in our, our pastries or in our sodas or in our, um, our favorite desserts or even just in our favorite meals. I already mentioned some things like great foods that I really like, like samosas and Thai fried rice and all that. But there's a lot of oil in there. You know, there's a lot of extra calories in there. There's a lot of extra fat. And so you got to be aware of that kind of stuff. And so the, the food awareness 
and you can have control. That's the thing, Tom. You can you can have, especially coming from a bodybuilding standpoint, doing it for so long, burning fat was like, you know, you know, specialty of mine. That's what you have to be able to do to get up on stage and be in shape for bodybuilding. You know, I, I just had an understanding of what I was consuming every day and what I was doing for exercise every day. And if I want to eat a little bit more, and my appetite is just so that I want a little bit extra food, okay, well, then I got to go for an extra 20 minutes on the Stairmaster or walking with the dogs or, you know, with the dumbbells at home, you know, whatever, like I've got to offset that. And so that awareness is so pivotal, pivotal, and, and so many people don't know that equation for themselves, what they're consuming uh, versus what they're expending. And most importantly, what types of calories they're consuming. How do we figure out how how much we burn? Is that something that we look through, like having a watch that tracks your workouts? Like, how do you know? Yeah, you, you can. Um, what I use is the Harris-Benedict equation. So there's a thing called the Harris-Benedict equation or Harris-Benedict calculator. And what it does is it, it factors in your gender, age, height, weight, and also activity level. So basically, um, you know, your, uh, your, your basal metabolic rate uh, plus your activity level on top of that, and it gives you, you know, some sort of figure, um, you know, based on all those factors, it'll say, okay, you know, so you're this, uh, I don't know, 35 year old male, six feet tall, 175 pounds, and you're working out with pretty high intensity five days per week for 60 minutes per day. I mean, you can fill out all these categories and it says, okay, you expend about 2,782 calories per day. Now it's not perfect. It's not perfect science, but it's, you know, it's the best we've got that I know of. Uh, and it's, it's been helpful for me uh, very much so over the years. And so now here, now this, this imaginary person I just made up, which I think the number I rattled off was, which I also made up was like 2,782 calories. Okay. Now we know that that person X expends that amount uh, on average per day. So we need to consume fewer calories, right? We want to lose weight. So we, we can't be sitting here consuming 3000 calories a day, 3,200, 3,500, 4,000 without even knowing it, because we just really love buttery popcorn, soda, ice cream, and, you know, ranch dressing on our, on our baked potato. We have to be aware of that kind of stuff and say, you know what, I'm going to eat 2,500 calories every day. And I'm going to do it for months, 2,500 or, you know, a little bit less perhaps. So now that person with a 2,700 and 82 calorie baseline, they're, they're, if you're under eating by 282 calories every day, guess what? After just two days, that's 500 calories deficit. You know, that's, what is that? A, you know, 3000, uh, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> 3,500 in a week, whatever, whatever the math is, you see where I'm going with it. That's what you do. You use something like a Harris Benedict calculator, you figure it out. And then you use something like my fitness pal or or chronometer or some other, you know, tech gadget, um, uh, you know, so you don't have to just memorize how many calories are in a banana or potato or a pound of broccoli. And you, you figure it out and you, and you just have consistent habits, consistent behavior, and then you lose weight over time. There's also other tricks you can do uh, that I, I personally think are effective, which is uh, choosing to do exercise often in, in a, in a fasted state uh, in a more efficient fat burning zone, doing cardiovascular training, perhaps uh, first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, or following a weight training workout, where you finish a weight training workout, you know, you've just hammered out an hour, you know, of heavy weight training, you're hungry, you're tired, your body's saying, man, you're out of glycogen stores, man, you're out of carbohydrate fuel, I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull some fat, you know, some stored fat as fuel here, because that's what I need, because I'm hungry. And so your body will use some of that stored fat as fuel and you can get some better results. And so, and that's what I'm doing right now. So when I finish a workout, I, uh, at least every other workout, not every single one, but every other workout, I finish up with weights and then I go do some cardio, uh, after that, like Stairmaster, elliptical bike, a walk, a run, you know, that kind of thing. I love that. Those are all so many great tips and you know for a lot of times losing weight can be quite discouraging because it does take a long time yeah. unlike yeah. you know reading a book that might take a week losing weight could sometimes take months or to get to your goal maybe years yeah so i'm wondering you know for someone starting out in the fitness realm you know wanting to start working out or running or whatever exercise that they have found that they enjoy what advice would you have for them that's the key you just said it 
you got to find what you enjoy. If I'm just telling you, Tom, I need you to go use the Stairmaster. You are not going to do it because it's hard work and nobody likes it. I agree. You just, you just, I mean, I, I do it, but I don't love it. In fact, I, you know, I'm intimidated by it at times because it's like you're just climbing and I, and I climb over a hundred flights of stairs at a time. When I use it, it's, you know, it's a daunting task. And so you've got to find what you enjoy. That's the key. You just said it. You find what you enjoy. That's, that could be dancing. That could be hiking. That could be swimming. That could be cycling. That could be team sports, throwing a Frisbee, running with your dog, whatever. That's the, that's the only way to do it. And you've got to connect the dots. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I know I can read a book in a week, but fat is going to take me a, a year to burn. But by not doing it, you're not getting any closer. By just you know procrastinating or being discouraged or not taking action or not doing it, th- th- does not get you any closer. And that's how a lot of us do, myself included. I've done that so many times, either in fitness or even other endeavors, trying to write a book or learn a language or whatever. If you don't do it, if you don't practice, you're just, you're just not going to get any closer. And so even if it sucks, even if it's you know not always fun, discouraging, there's other things you'd rather do like watch television or look on the internet or, or chat with a friend on social media or, or you know spend time in whatever it is, spend time in nature, whatever you do with your, your time carve out a little bit of time for that exercise or for that nutrition dietary discipline. Because if you can connect the dots in advance, so you know what, if I can follow this clean eating program for a month, you know, it's going to maybe reset some habits and taste buds and preferences. And, and it'll just become a, you know, a second nature. And I'll just I'll carry into my next month. And man, imagine nine months from now where I'll be. Imagine, imagine 15 months from now where I'll be. And, and it's actually like not reading a book, Tom, but like writing a book, man, it's hard to get started. This thing's going to take two years, two years, no matter how fast I am or how good I am, how many pages I can write, you know, the editor, you know, writers, co-writers, co-authors, editors, publishers are always going to say, go back, give me more, do this better, do it again, rewrite this, scrap these hundred pages that not any good, rewrite this entire chapter for a third time. And it's, you have to like, man, imagine you, 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 you know, sign a book deal and you've got expectations to deliver within 18 months. You, you got to chip away at it every day. You got to show up day after day. And that's the same with weight loss. You have to show up day after day. And, and, and my, my concise advice would be that determine why you want to lose weight in the first place. Who cares? Who cares what other people think? You know, who cares, you know, what you think? Who cares about health? Who cares about wellness? Who cares about how you physically feel in the, in the current weight that you have? You answer those questions, you know? And if it moves you enough to start moving more because you know what a, what, what a different result could feel like physically or, or emotionally or mentally, then do something that you enjoy doing, that you love doing uh, to burn calories and go do it. It could be as simple as, Working out, like I, what I usually do is I often work out while I watch basketball because it's my favorite sport to watch. And I sometimes feel a little bit guilty if I'm just going to sit on a couch and watch other people exercise for two and a half hours, I'm going to work out too. And so I do the uh, curls while I'm, I'm watching the game and all that. So find what you enjoy doing, know why you're doing it and be consistent and connect the dots and allow results to take place over time. I love that. So essentially the way that I understood that, which I think is a really nice rephrase is find the hardest thing you can do that you enjoy the most and find an easy way to do it, which is if you love it, it becomes easier. If you can watch basketball while doing bicep curls, it becomes easier because you've got that something to bring you into the present moment and let you really bask in the glory of the, of the present day, I guess, in a way. Look, you've got this, this next question is a little bit redundant, but I want you to see, you know, a few months in advance, you've got this book coming out and it'll be out by the time this episode goes live. Yeah. You know, you've, you've got these expectations. You're expecting it to be a New York bestseller or that's your, that's, that, that's our goal. That's our, I haven't talked a lot about that, but that's our ultimate goal is to be a New York times bestseller. And we, we feel like we, uh, we have the tools to do that. What, what is going to go through your mind? When you, when you achieve that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong dream. You know, um, I didn't know what a New York times bestseller was when I was eight years old, but I knew I wanted to be a writer. And as I got older, 
I, and I started writing books. I, I knew exactly what it was uh, to see a bestseller in stores and to see big displays of books in stores and to know you can impact a lot of people with your message and with your words, with your art, with your craft, uh, with your passion, whatever you're sharing. And it's something I've always wanted. And you know, even if it doesn't happen, let's say it doesn't make the New York Times bestseller, but it's still a bestseller on all these other charts and these, you know, Wall Street Journal and USA Today and Amazon and all this, you know, that will still feel fulfilling. But I think what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to do the best that we can to position ourselves to achieve that. And it's, it goes back to the why, because if we achieve that, what does that mean? It means the plant-based athlete is in the homes of, of thousands of people who are very likely not plant-based and therefore has a potential positive impact on them and the food choices they'll make maybe for the rest of their lives. And the, the exercise uh, pursuits they will or will not take and, and, the, and the, the compelling stories that may inspire them to find the best version of themselves. And, and that will mean something. And so that's, that's the goal is to have it mean something. And it's going to mean a lot to me. I've, I've been trying to do this for a long time. I've, I've self-published books and I've driven around the country. I've slept in my car uh, more nights than I can count, you know, when I you know, couldn't afford a motel or hotel and I was trying to, you know, sell books out of my car and, and uh, go from city to city or to vegan festival to vegan festival or uh, you know, try, just trying to make this dream happen. And I've been rejected by publishers. I've been rejected by agents. I've been told I'm not good enough over and over and my work's not good enough that maybe I should do something different or that I'm just not really the person to write these books. But I wanted to. And so I went after it anyway. And I thought I had a compelling way with words. And, uh, and so I pursued it. And so to achieve that is, uh, it will be certainly one of the highlights of my life. And it's, it's crazy to think that it's eight weeks away um, that, that I'll be able to know if we make that New York Times bestseller list on our debut week. There's a chance if we don't, we can make it in the future. But you've got to sell about 10 to 15,000 copies per week. Uh, to make that bestseller list. And the way that it works with this, our very first week is that all pre-orders, every order from now until June 19th, all contribute to that. So that's why bestsellers are often made um, when a book comes out, when it's first released. And then, and then maybe it never has a chance again, because you have three months to sell 15,000 copies, not just six days. So uh You'll, you'll hear about it. You know, if we make it, you'll hear about it. And if we don't, you'll probably hear about it too. But, uh, but I appreciate, uh, appreciate that question because it's, uh, it's an emotional roller coaster and it's a lifelong dream. And uh, I'm really, I'm really pulling for it. I love it. I think it's a great question, not only because, you know, it gives us an insight to who you are and, and what that could mean, but also the insane grit it takes to firstly write a book like that takes years not that i've got experience but everyone who i've ever heard has written a book to just say it is a nightmare and a half and you only get that first joy at the very end not even when you publish it but after the marketing and after all that so it's an insane cacophony an avalanche of work over years at a time um so i'm really glad and i, I hope i hope to hell you get on that list but to finish up, um, obviously, I'm going to leave the book linked to the bio so everyone can check it out and all the best places to connect with you. But Thank you. to finish, I want to give you the platform and an opportunity to take the stage and leave us with a bit of your wisdom. Of course, you've done that for the past hour, but I want to give you an, a space of time where you can talk about absolutely anything you want. It could be something related to what we're talking about today, or it could be something completely different. I know you don't watch TV, so it's not going to be a TV show. It could be about your workout. It could be about, you know, relationships, but the stage is all yours, my friend. Yeah. Th thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me on again. Really appreciate it. And I, you know, I think I'm going to leave you with someone else's wisdom. You, you know, I mean, everything that I know, I learned from other people, aside from the things I had to stumble along my own way and, and carve my own path and learn along that journey of lots of bumps and failures. And, you know, hopefully, you know, found my way out on the other side most times. But one thing that really resonates with me is a quote from H. Jackson Brown Jr., 
who wrote in a book, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you did do. And then he goes on to say, so, you know, sail away from the safe harbors, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. That's poetic stuff. I don't really care about. But what I do care about is whether it's 20 years from now or two years from now, you don't want to be asking what might have been. Man, I had an opportunity to change my diet and change my life. And I didn't do it. And now here's my reality. Or, you know, I always wanted to pursue this dream, but I just, you know, you couldn't find the courage to do it. Um, or I never knew that I could believe in myself because I was discouraged from doing so because others didn't believe in me. And, and I really believe that is one of the, the, the powerful messages that, that, that at the end of the day, we are going to be more disappointed by the things we didn't do, the dreams we didn't pursue, the actions we didn't take, the things we didn't say than by the things that we did do. And so I think about that. I think about how that relates to me, how it relates to my life, uh, what I can do for others. Um, and I just, I have a lot of gratitude as I think about that message of, of you know, the, whatever awakening I had 25 years ago and, and been so fortunate to dedicate a quarter century of my life to reducing the suffering of others. And imagine if I hadn't done that. Um, or imagine if I hadn't decided to lift those weights. I wouldn't have this story. I wouldn't be talking to you. If I, if I, if I gave up after my first books were rejected and turned down by everybody else and said I, what, they weren't good enough. And now, you know, I have that, that ultimate story to write, you know, when I do become a bestseller and I do have that story of vegan bodybuilding and I do make that impact, you know, for, for animals and for the environment. And so that quote Again, it's often um, it's often attributed to Mark Twain, but it's it's H. Jackson Brown, H. Jackson Brown Jr. Twenty years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you did do. And so, with that, I tell people to follow your passion and make it happen. You know, it's scary, it's hard to go pursue a dream. You know, it's hard to believe in yourself. You know, it's it's it, it's hard to to build muscle or to burn fat or to do something super meaningful that impacts others besides ourselves, but you know, do it anyway, or at least, you know, give it the best shot you've got. Uh, and also, but, but with that, not to just be, you know, fully rah, 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 you can do it. You can do anything. Also realize that it's okay to stop doing something if it's not working. It's, it's okay. I mean, people, people don't like to say this word, but it's okay to quit. It's okay to stop and quit and reflect and pursue something else. I mean, I quit as a runner, right? I quit. I did bodybuilding instead, and it took my life in a completely different direction. You know, I quit making movies. I made one documentary, and then I tried a second one, and it failed. I couldn't get the right funding. You know, people quit on the project. You know, I couldn't do it. I, I, so I quit doing that and started writing books. You, you know, um, I quit competitive bodybuilding. I was only 29 when I stopped competing because I wanted to be a writer. You know, I had, I, I had competed. I won bodybuilding competitions. I did my thing. I was ready for something else. It's okay to quit. It's okay to change. It's okay to pivot. And, and that's actually what makes life beautiful is that you try lots of different things and you see what sticks, you know, you see what resonates, you see what, what brings that joy. And then when you find those things that bring joy, go after it and, and get as much out of it as you can. And very likely because of how much you get out of that process, it's also a good chance you're impacting others in a positive way. Wow, that was a lot. That was great. That was amazing. Um, I got a little bit taken aback while talking, reflecting on my own life. And I hope that everyone listening to this does as well. And I want to touch on something to finish up in my words of gratitude to you um, look, 25 years ago, you made that decision to save animals and, and sorry, not save animals, but not contribute to the suffering. And in a uh, close cousin to that, you inspired people to make that same choice and in turn saving those animals. So not only as a fellow human, but as a fellow vegan, I really thank you for that. It doesn't go unnoticed um every little change that you've inspired both yourself to make those people in your life and 
the beautiful souls over on the World Wide Web to make changes that really not only benefit them and our body and our health and our vitality, but also the planet, you know, in, in times of climate change and loss of biodiversity and all of that, but also the billions and trillions of animals who have to suffer each and every year because of the unfortunate choices of the human race. So I implore you, I thank you sincerely, not only for your time, but for all of that. And look, I really can't wait. I, I wish you nothing but good vibes and good luck for this book. And I can't wait to read. I hope everyone does do a pre-order to help get on this list. And if not, get in that first few weeks when everyone listens. I can only imagine the absolute wisdom in those thousands of words written in there. So thank you once again for your time, Rob. It's been a pleasure to meet you, get to know you, and I will see you next time. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the platform and the opportunity to share with your audience today. And I appreciate you hosting. And I, I hope you have a beautiful rest of your week. Hi there. Welcome to the end of the episode. Thank you for lending me your ears and listening the whole way through. That's amazing. And I really appreciate you. Thank you, Robert, once again for spending your time and coming on and sharing your wisdom with us in the community and myself. Really appreciate it. And I'm excited to dig into your new book. If you found this conversation valuable, the best way you could help out our show is by either leaving a review on Apple or iTunes or any other podcasting app, clicking that follow button, or even sharing this conversation with friends and family. If you got those macho heads in the gym that are maybe not adopting a plant-based diet because they think that they will just lose all their muscle overnight, maybe this is a good resource to send them. Maybe Robert's Instagram page is a good resource to send to them. And I wanted to finish up with a question, something that we dive deep into in this conversation, which is, what is your why? What is that intrinsic motivation? Knowing that will keep you focused on your goal, whether that's staying true to a whole foods, plant-based diet, or maybe that's just staying vegan and avoiding animal products, or maybe that's something work-related or fitness-related. Maybe that's something you need so you can ensure you finish your marathon training and run that marathon, or potentially so you can do 20 pull-ups, I don't know, whatever it may be, find that out for yourself. But I will see you guys next week. Stay happy, eat plants, peace.